Hey y'all! In my last video, I introduced the idea of composite modeling, taking several different separate 3D models from the Vectric Clip Art Library and combining them into one 3D model. In this video, I'm going to dig in and show you exactly how I combined all of these elements to make this composite model. So, first thing we need to do is get into a new session of Aspire. And again, even though I'm using Aspire 9.5, everything I'm going to show in this video can also be done in the exact same way in vCarve Desktop and vCarve Pro. In our job setup, this is a single-sided job. My width in X is 12 inches, and I also have a 12-inch height in Y. For thickness, I'm using a nominal 3 quarters of an inch. What I mean by that is, when I actually get the material to carve this model, I will measure it and then come back and change this if necessary. But for the purposes of layout and calculating the tool paths, I'm going to use three quarters of an inch. The actual material may vary. I'm going to set my Z0 position to the material surface. And for layout purposes, my XY datum position will be in the center. After I get everything laid out and I'm ready to start calculating tool paths, I will change that to the bottom left corner because that's where I actually set the X, Y, and Z zero outside on my machine. My modeling resolution, I'm going for very high, which means there will be 4 million points out here covering this piece of material. We'll go ahead and click OK. To start assembling what's going on here, I'm going to need to draw at least one 2D vector first to get started. And that is I want to circle about 11 and a half inches in diameter out here and use that as a reference point for where I'm going to place that rope border on the outside perimeter of my model. I'll go in here under Create Vectors to draw a circle. I want the center point of my circle to be my x0, y0. And I want the diameter to be 11.5 inches. So we'll click Create. And there is my circle. I'll close that. Now I can start importing some models. This just gives me a reference as to how large this project is going to be. To start importing models, I'll go over here into my clip art tab. And I've already gone into clip art. And the first thing I want to put in here is I want to put this dome in the center. And we'll see if I can remember that it's a dome in this video instead of dish like the last video. So I'll select domes and dishes. And here's the one I want to use right here, Dome Dish 30. To put it in the center of my model, I'll just double click it, and a copy goes into the center. Well, now I want to set this to a certain size. I think I'd like, I want this dome to be about 7 inches in diameter. So, I'll come over here to my modeling tab and we see it is selected and it's in move and transform mode. I can come up here under transform objects to set selected object size. I'll click that icon. I want to anchor it in the center. I want to make sure I have link X, Y checked. And then I can choose either one, either the width or height. It doesn't matter in this case. And I'll enter 7.0. Then click Apply. And now we see I have a big dome out here. I'll go ahead and click Close. 
right off the bat we have our dome dish here in uh, level one which is going to be the only level that I'm uh, going to use in this video. We'll get into various levels in future videos. But I want to check a couple of things. Number one, I want to check the combine mode. And the combine mode right now is set to merge. That means that it's going to merge with anything else that I either put on the model or attach to the model. That's how it's going to interact with any other 3D models. I want to keep it that way. But I also want to check on how thick this model is, how tall it is. So for that I'll need to use my 3D view. And rather than switching back and forth with the tabs here, I'll go ahead and tile them vertically. Now I can rock my model this way and I can see about how tall it is. And that's a pretty tall model. It's pretty thick. So I'll go back to my straight Z view. And I want to get into the properties of this model and adjust how thick it is. So to do that, I'll make sure I have the name selected. Then I'll go up here to this wrench icon. And that is change the properties of the selected model. So we'll go ahead and we'll click on that. Up here we see the combine mode is set to merge. And right down here we have the shape height. Well right now it's not quite a half inch tall. That's just too much. I don't want it to be this thick. So I think I want it to be a maximum of about a quarter of an inch thick. So I'll go ahead and highlight that there. And enter 2.5. We see that this updated, it kind of changed color. Now I can rock my model back and we see it's not quite as thick as it was. That's a little bit better. Okay, so I'll go to my straight Z view again. The rest of this down here, we will get into in future videos. They don't apply to this project as it sits right now. So I can go ahead and hit close. Now what I want to do is add that flourish to the center of this dome. So we'll go back to the clip art tab and I'll come up here into my decorative models and scroll down here and look for that flourish. I'll double click that to set one in the center of my model. Out here in the 3D view, we see that we have a bit of a mess. So let's go back over into the modeling tab and see if we can figure out what's going on here. The areas in brown, darker brown here, tell me that it's selected. But the areas in green are inside this dome. It's embedded inside the dome. And if I look over here at my flourish, I can see that the combine mode is set to merge. So with both of these set to merge, this dome and this flourish are merging together. Well, I don't want this flourish to merge with this dome. I want it to be added up on top of the dome. So I'll come back over here to flourish, make sure it's selected, right click it, Go in here to Combine Mode, and I want to change that to Add. I'll click on that. It updated over here in our 3D view. And now I can see that it's been added on top of that dish. Now, looking at this model here, looking down the Y axis, I can see that this flourish is a bit thick as well. I don't want it to be this thick. So to fix this, change its thickness. Again, we'll make sure it's selected. Go back up here to Properties, and we see it's a little over a quarter of an inch thick. That's too much for me. I want it to be, I don't want it to be as thin as an eighth of an inch. So I'm going to try 0.15. That's a little bit thicker than an eighth of an inch. We see it updated. It kind of flattened out here somewhat. 
And that's much, much better. I didn't lose any detail in the model itself, but now it doesn't project out as far as it did. I still need to be able to carve this into a three-quarter inch thick piece of material. I have my flourish. I have my dome. We're all set there. I can close the properties. Come back to clip art and I can start adding these rope borders. One of the rope borders I want out here as my outside perimeter. I want that to be my profile cutout. This line here, this vector, is here just as a guide to help me kind of place that. So now let's go over here to the borders. And I'm going to scroll down to the rope borders. And there are two of them. There's this big rope circle which is not exactly the style I'm looking for. I'm looking for something a little thinner. So I've chosen this one here. Now I've got two of them. I've got one that's going to go right here in the center. And I've got another one that's going to go out here for my edge. I'm going to place this one first. So we'll double click on it to put one in the center of the model. And then it's automatically in move and transform mode. So I'm going to hold down shift, grab one of these white squares on the corners, and I'm going to drag it from the corner. And I want to pull it out here so that it's covering that area right about here where the dome meets the modeling plane. I want it to cover that. And if I zoom in here in my 3D view, scoot that over a bit, and kind of rock it back, we can see that it is merging with the model here. And it's covering that area where the dome meets the modeling plane out here. Now, if I go into my modeling tab and take a look at it, the combined mode on it is set to merge. And that's how I want it to be. I want it to merge with this dome. If I were to set it to add, it would attempt to add the thickness of this rope out here on top of the dome. I'll go ahead and change it to show you what I'm talking about. I'll right click, change the combined mode to add, and as you can see, it bent the rope here, right in this area, to try to add its full thickness on top of this dome. Now that's not the look that I'm going for. I want it to be nice and flat. I want it to look like it's embedded in this dome. So I'll go back over here, change my combine mode to merge, and it smoothed out that rope border so that now it looks as though it's been actually stitched down onto the modeling plane. So while we're over here, I want to check on the properties. So we'll go ahead and click on this. And this is showing as 0.1546 inches tall is fine. It looks OK to me. I'm not going to touch it. It is shorter than this dome and flourish combined. So it's not going to project any height up out of the material. So I'm going to call that just fine. Now we need another rope border to add out here. So let me go back to a straight Z view here. And we'll go back to clip art. And we'll double click another border here into the center. And again, I'll hold down Shift, and I'll drag this border out. I'll drag it out here to where it's just touching this vector here. You can see it's just on this line. So that is telling me now that the outside, the larger areas of this rope braid, are right there on that edge. So I've got an outside diameter of 11 and a half inches. So now I can 
click off of that, zoom back in, and I no longer need this vector. I can simply delete it. Now I can select that rope border, go back into my modeling tab, we'll check the properties and see how thick it is. It's just under a quarter of an inch thick. I'm going to leave that be. That's, that's fine. It's not going to project up any taller than the uh, flourish here in the center. And I can check that by either left clicking and kind of rocking this back or I can select a straight Y view and I can see here the flourish sitting on top of the dome is the tallest part of the model and I think that'll be fine. We'll go ahead and we'll go back to a straight Z view. We're now finished with the 3D portions of this model. That's all we needed to do. We needed to make certain that our dome and our flourish merged the correct way with the flourish added to the top of the dome. We needed to make sure this rope border merged with the dome. And then this rope border is set to merge with whatever we should add out here. We're not going to be adding anything. So I can close the properties. The next few steps are going to be all two dimensional so I don't need my 3D view up here anymore. I can go ahead and maximize my 2D view now and zoom to where it's filling my uh, screen. In order to put this text in here in this area I'm going to have to pocket this area out. Then I can v-carve the text. In order to pocket this area out, I need a vector here and a vector here. To get those vectors, what I'll do first of all is I'll select the outside rope border. I'll come over here under Modeling Tools to create vector boundary around selected components. If I click that icon and zoom in, we see it's created a vector around the outside and the inside of this rope border. But we also see that these are solid pink lines. These vectors are solid pink, not dotted pink. That indicates that they are grouped. So what I'll do on this is right click, come up here to ungroup objects, ungroup back on to original object layers. I'll click that and now we have, if I click off, two separate vectors. They are closed vectors but they're separate. Now I need to do the same thing here. I'll select that rope border and in fact what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to rename this rope border so that I don't get the two confused. So with this border selected I'll make sure that uh, the name is highlighted. I'll right click and I'll select rename. Then all I'm going to do is get rid of the number here and type inner. Oops. Caps lock. There. Hit enter and now I know that this is the inner rope border. I'll select this, right click, rename, and this is the outer border. That's just for me. Now to get back to what we were doing, I'll select this rope border and again come up here to create vector boundary and click that icon. Now if I zoom in here, I have a vector outside and inside. I'll select them and again right click, ungroup objects, back onto their original layers. Select that. Now I can click off 
and I have two separate vectors. I do not need this vector here. The only vector I need is this one outside here. So with this one selected, I can just tap delete and it's gone. So now when I go to create this pocket in here, I have this vector here, hold down shift, that vector there, and that will determine where the pocket is going to be. So now what I can do is concentrate on getting the text in here that I'm going to be V carving. I'm going to apply the text to a curve. So I need an upward curve here and I need a downward curve here. So the easiest way to do that is to just draw a circle out here and size it accordingly. So I'll go back over to my drawing tab go here under create vectors to draw a circle and I'm not exactly sure how big to make this circle but if I put my cursor over in here I'm somewhere close to four inches away from the center about four and a quarter four and a half yeah about four and a half inches so Four and a half times two is nine. I'll make a nine inch circle here and we can adjust it from there. I'll click create, then close, and it's not exactly in the middle, so I'll select it, click it again, and I'll just kind of nudge it a little bit to where it should roughly be. Right about in there somewhere. That's a little bit better. It doesn't have to. To be exactly in the center between these two because we'll be adjusting the text as well. With the circle drawn now we can get into a little bit of note editing because what I need to do is instead of having a complete circle here is I need two different arcs. I need an arc running up and I need an arc running down. Now I have already done a two-part series on applying text to a curve and I'll put a link to that series up here in a card right about now. So I'm not going to take the time to go over applying text to a curve 100%. I'll just show you what I do. You can refer to those videos for a more complete discussion on applying text to a curve. The short version is I need two separate arcs here instead of one complete circle. So with that circle selected, I'll type the letter N on my keyboard and go into node editing mode. Now I have a start point up here. We see the arrow is going around counterclockwise. It's pointing in a counterclockwise direction. I need to cut this circle here and here to make it two arcs, one up here, the other down below. And I'll do that by putting my cursor over this one here first, over this black point first, right click, cut vector. Changes my start point to this point right here. Come back over here, right click again, cut vector. Now I'll just confirm that down here I have an arc running this way, up here, I have an arc running this way. My start point is over here for both of them. That's what I need. I'll come out here and left click to deselect, right click to come out of node editing. Now I can start entering my text. So I'll come over here to the draw text icon and the font that I've chosen for this text is called Possum Saltaire. And I'll put a link in the description below to this font, but it kind of gives it an old timey, almost Roman feel. And also, I don't attempt to spell any of this because it's in Latin. For those of you who don't speak or understand Latin, this roughly translates to this isn't a good idea and we shouldn't be doing it, roughly. 
what I'll do here, because I need text up on top and on the bottom, I've split it up into two lines. I'll copy the two lines here. I'll copy the first one by using Control C. Come over here to my text window and click in the box. Control V to paste. And we have our text out here. Now the text height here is set for three quarters of an inch centered. We'll see if we have to adjust that down the road. And I'll hit close. Now with my text already selected, I'll hold down shift and select that arc up here in the top half. I'll then come over here under create vectors to this icon right here, text on a curve. I'll click that icon and we see that it moves my text onto that curve. But we have a lot of adjusting to do. The first thing we'll do is we'll click on this button here. Right now by maintain select text size it stays at three quarters of an inch tall. I'm going to scale it to fit the to fill the curve and it's set up at a hundred percent right now. This will probably change. I'm going to leave my text spacing alone for a minute. For the position I want it on the curve. So when I put my button there it will be based on the curve itself. Now I'll come down here my text alignment. I want it aligned from the center. And I want to align the text to the curve. I don't want to keep it vertical. So we'll do that. And we see right here that now our text is aligned around the curve. So now what I'll need to do is I'll need to do some spacing and scaling because we have now this letter H and the letter A come down and meet the, the, the center point here. And I think that's just a little bit too big. I don't want it to come quite down that far. So let me go ahead and drop my scale text to fill curve down to, let's go down to about 95%. And you can see right here that's opened up a little bit more space right here. It's also made the text a little bit smaller, but it has opened it up a little bit. And I think that's going to work just fine. Right here, the text spacing, if I were to come in and use that, what it would do is it would increase the text, the, the space between, say, this N and this O, which don't need it. The only ones that do need it really are this E and this S. They're a little bit close together. And the same over here with the I and the D. They're fairly close together, but the A is touching the E. Those need to be separated. Since the rest of the spacing looks okay, I'm not going to adjust my text spacing here. I'll do that in another process in just a minute. I'm going to go ahead and leave my scale text at about 95% and we'll click close. Now to space these letters apart a little bit, I'll come over here again under create vectors to this icon right here, edit text spacing and curve. I'll click on that icon and You'll see how my cursor has changed. I have a letter T underneath the arrow now. But when I bring it over here near text, you see how it changes to a couple of letters with some arrows in between. And you'll see those arrows are pointing inwards. Well, if I were to come in and click between a couple of letters here now, it would move those letters closer together. And I don't want to do that. I want to zoom in here and I want to separate this E and this S a little bit. So I'll just put my cursor somewhere in between the two, hold down shift and we see those arrows change and they're pointing outward. I'll go ahead and click once or twice and that kind of spreads those out but not so far they look like they're too far apart. Then I'll come down here 
between the I and the D, oops, and I forgot to hold down shift, so I moved them closer together. Let me hold down shift and click once to put them back where they were. Now we'll open them up a little bit. That was three clicks there. That looks okay. And I'll do the same down here. Hold down shift. One, two, three. Let me zoom out. See how that looks. That's better. This may be a little too far apart. Yeah, let me... That's better. Move them back in towards one another a little bit. I think the rest of them look okay. I don't think they're too far apart at all. And I think we'll leave them just like that. Okay, now I can come down here back to regular selection mode and click that icon to get away from the text tool. Okay, that's one line of text. Let's open up my text window, grab my other line of text, and copy and paste. Now this is again set to that three-quarter inch. I have a feeling it's going to be too big and won't fit in this arc here, but that's okay because the software will change it when we go to apply it to the curve. So we have that selected. We'll select this arc also. We'll come up and click text on a curve and sure enough it says selected text is too long to fit on the curve. I'll click OK and we see it's adjusted the size to fit it. Now I'll go through the same tools that I went with it automatically switched over to scale text to fill the curve because it was too long. I'm going to bring it down some more. I mean, let's go down to 90 on this one and see what happens. Well, 89 then. Uh, that looks a little bit better. This E is close to the same distance away from the center line as the H is. I'll go up just one notch here. Uh, yeah, I think that will work. That looks a little better. I'm going to again leave the spacing alone. I'm going to put it on the curve. Make sure it's in the middle. And I'll align the text to the curve. Now you'll notice that changed these positions here. I'm way below the center line. So now I can come along, drag this back up a little bit see what we find here and I can go a little more I think that looks okay this text will always be a little bit smaller height wise than this text simply because there's more of it so in order to center it right and make it big enough to see I think that's about as far as I want to go there uh, again, I'm not going to change my text spacing here because while some of these letters are too close together, some of them are a little too far apart. So I'll close this window here, go back up to adjust my text spacing, and I'll come in here, hold down shift, click there. I'll come in here without touching shift and bring these closer together. And that looks good. Now, because I've tightened some of this up and loosened others up a little bit, I'm going to go back up here and adjust my spacing one more time. I'll have to select the arc as well. And that applied the changes without me having to do anything. So, click close. We're good. And there's the text that I want to vCar. Now that I'm finished with this, I can get rid of these two arcs because I no longer need them. I'll just select one, hold down shift, select the other, and tap delete. That is it as far as the design is concerned. I'm ready to start calculating toolpaths. So, we'll go over here to the Toolpath tab.
So the first thing I want to do is I want to come over here into my material setup. I'll click on that icon and my material thickness is three quarters of an inch. Again, when I get the actual material to cut this model, this may change. Right here, I'm going to go ahead and change my XY datum to the bottom left corner. Again, because that's where I set the XY and Z zero outside on the machine. And I'm finished with the layout, so I no longer need my XY datum point to be in the center. My Z0 is going to be set to the material surface. The model position in the material, my total model thickness is 0.4 inches. That's good. That leaves me a 0.35 inch gap below the model, meaning that that 0.35 inches is more or less a base height. The model won't actually start until it won't carve down below that 0.35. I do, however, need a little bit more of a gap on top of the model. And the reason for that is, let me go ahead and bring my 3D view back in here, and I'll tile them vertically. The reason I want a little bit of a gap on the top of the material is because up here on the very top, we have some little projections up here that stick up. I want to make absolutely certain that these aren't missed and this area is a little flat. That the top surface of the material remains up here. I want to put a little bit of material up here on top by pushing the model position down so that the CNC has to carve down into the material to get to these fine details up here at the tallest point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it that the actual model starts about, well, let's go with 50 thousandths, 0.05 inches. So now what will happen is the bit will come along and remove 50 thousandths of material off the top, then start carving the model. I'm going to leave all the rest of this alone and we'll hit OK. Now what I need to do is I want to do a 3D roughing toolpath. So I'll go ahead and start a 3D roughing toolpath. For this I'm going to use a quarter inch end mill. I'm going to machine to the model boundary around the edge of the last, the, the 3D component that's the furthest out from the center. That way, when it machines away this material here, I still have these corners at the original material thickness that I can set my Z0 to after the tool change. So I'll go to the model boundary. However, for the roughing tool path, I'm going to use a boundary offset of half an inch. What that means is when the roughing tool path cuts away the material, it's going to come a half inch out from the edge of the model and cut away the material out here a little bit for a couple of reasons. Number one, to make sure that it actually cuts all the way down to the depth of the model out here. And number two, to open this up, give me a little bit of room so that I can get a smaller bit down in here when I'm doing my 3D carve and when I go to do my profile cutout. You'll see why in a minute. So, boundary offset of 0.5. Normally, under normal conditions, I would set the boundary offset to the tool's diameter. I want a little bit more of an offset this time, just for my own personal comfort level. The machining allowance is 30 thousandths of an inch. I'm doing that so that this roughing tool path will leave a skin of about 30 thousandths of an inch thick for the finishing tool path to remove. I'm going to do a Z-level roughing strategy, rastering in X, meaning it's going to cut from left to right. 
we'll just name the toolpath 3D roughing and we'll calculate. Okay, and there is our toolpath. We'll go ahead and preview it. And we see what we are left with here. When we did that boundary offset, we also see that it carved in here quite a distance. And that's good. Our rope border runs right here. This area here is going to be pocketed out. So for our V carving. But it couldn't pocket out everything, so we're going to have to come in and do a uh, pocketing toolpath. We need to know how deep to cut that pocketing toolpath, though. And we won't know that until after the 3D finishing toolpath. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to rough pocket this out just for the preview, then come back and change that depth. So we're going to start with by looking down here at my displays, my X, Y, and Z readouts down here, when I put my cursor over the material, we see the Z level is at zero. When I come over here into this area, we see that the Z level is negative 0.375, and the same over here. That means that in the roughing tool path, it's going to cut down to that depth. Right now, I'm going to calculate a pocket tool path to that depth. So I'll remember 0.375. This will change. So I'll close. Come over here and select that vector. Hold down Shift. Select that vector. That's the area I want pocketed out. And I'll do a pocketing tool path. I want to start at zero and I want to cut down to 0.375. I'll use a quarter inch end mill. It'll do it in two passes. I'm not going to use a large area clearance tool for this. I'm going to use an offset clearing strategy because it is a circle. It'll move just that much quicker to get rid of it rather than going back and forth. And we'll call this the pocket. I'll calculate it. Then we'll preview that toolpath. Okay, so that clears out that area for our V carving. Speaking of which, before we do our V carving, I want to go ahead and do the 3D finishing toolpath. We'll close our preview, select a 3D finishing toolpath. I'm going to use a 1 16th inch tapered ball nose bit. I'm going to cut to the model boundary. And this time I'm going to use a boundary offset of a quarter of an inch. I'm going to raster this cut with a raster angle of zero. And we'll call this 3D finishing. Calculate. And this is going to take a while to do because of the modeling resolution. So while we're waiting for this to uh, calculate, if you haven't already, go ahead and click that subscribe button down below. And if you haven't clicked that bell, go ahead and do so. Then you'll be notified the next time I post a video. Okay, with that calculated, I'll go ahead and go to a straight Z view. We'll preview that toolpath. And there we go. Now, here's why I said that that was going to change. My pocket depth was going to change. When the 3D toolpath came along and cleaned all this out, it also cleaned up more of this pocket. And where we had 0.375 before, we can now see it's going to cut to a final depth a point four four nine nine. So what I'll do is I'll double click my pocketing tool path and I'll make my cutting depth point four four nine nine. Recalculate it. Preview it. And we now see it's nice and smooth there. The reason I did it that way 
was because I had to be certain how deep this model was going to be carved because I did not want this model projecting up from the V-carved area and I didn't want it sunken down inside of it as it was. With that all calculated now, I'm ready to do the, the V-carving here. So we'll close, select my text, hold down Shift, select this text, and we'll do a standard V-carve toolpath. Remembering the depth of this pocket, I want the start depth to be 0 0.4499. I'm not going to cut to a flat depth. I'm using a 90 degree V bit. I'm not using a flat area clearance tool. I'm going to leave everything else alone and we'll call this V carve text. We'll calculate that toolpath. I'll come up here and change the toolpath color to the blue and we'll preview that toolpath. Well, I could have gone with a darker blue, but this will do for now. Now I already see a change that I would like to make. I would like to change that text to bold. It needs to be a little bit thicker. So, let me undo last. We'll close this. I'll go back over to my drawing toolpath. The text is selected. I'll click on the text. Well, let me choose one. And I'll click on bold. Then I'll select this one. And I'll click on bold. Close. Then I can go back over. Double click my V carved text. It is selected both. I'll calculate. I'm going to make that a little bit darker this time and I'll preview that toolpath. That's much better. That's much better. So you can see you can make on the fly decisions, make some changes and uh, undo your last move, make those changes, recalculate the toolpath, then move on. That's what preview is all about. So we have one remaining toolpath, and that is the profile cutout. So I'll select that vector, close my preview, the profile tool path, and again, depending upon the thickness of my material, material, I want it to cut all the way through and then some. So up here in my cut depth, I'll highlight whatever's in there and type Z plus 0 0.005, meaning I wanted to cut the thickness of the material plus five thousandths of an inch, and hit the equal sign, which gives me my depth of cut. I'm going to use an eighth inch end mill. This is why I was concerned about a little bit more space out here, because my eighth inch end mill is physically shorter than a quarter inch end mill, means my collet will have to get down here closer to this model and I wanted a little bit more area around it to be able to cut around it. I could use a quarter inch end mill but I want to try to get a little bit better detail around these rope braids. So that's why I'm using the eighth inch end mill. I wanted to cut to the outside of that vector and I'm not going to do a separate last pass on this one. I'm going to leave everything else alone. Name it Profile Cutout. We'll calculate the tool path. It's warning me the tool will cut through the material. I know that. I want it to. I'll maximize my 3D view and we'll preview that toolpath. We see it cut out just fine. I'll double click the waste to get rid of it. And that is our finished model. The rope goes all the way around to the edges 
because of that eighth inch bit. My flourish sits nice and proud. My text is easily readable for those who speak Latin anyway. And we're ready to now save G code. I'm not going to save G code in this case because, as I said, these toolpaths will change when I get the material to actually cut it out. I hope you got something out of this video. I know I went very fast through this. I didn't go at my normal slow pace because there's a lot to get across here. If nothing else, know that by combining separate models and arranging them in the order that they need to be cut in, the first component on the bottom, because remember it models from the bottom up. So the dome dish has to be the first model. The flourish sits on top of that dome. It has to be second from the bottom. That rope interacts with it out here. It merges with it. That has to be above the dome. This rope border is not as important because it's not interacting with any other models out here. We also now know to watch out for the combine mode that if you have it set, for instance, this flourish set to merge, the software will embed it inside the dome. With it set to add, it sits on top of the dome. So, again, I hope you got something out of this video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up. And if you'd like to continue on with my further CNC adventures, I do hope you'll uh, subscribe to my channel. But, as usual, whether you subscribe to my channel or not, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time to watch, and y'all take care.